Hi everyone, and welcome back to In Plain Terms, the podcast for anyone looking for an easy and fun way into Shakespeare's plays. I know not everyone loves him as much as I do, so I wanted to offer a fun intro into the Bard's works. If you are new to Shakespeare, or just looking for a fun refresher, you have come to the right place. I will be breaking down the plays, briefly touching on some of the themes brought up in the play, and giving a bit of detail on the top insults in the play, because I believe Shakespeare is for everyone, not just the educated elite. I will be doing all of this while making some terrible jokes and just having a good time. So, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Most people's gateway drug. Their first taste of that sweet, sweet nectar that is our dear Lord and Saviour, Shakespeare. This fun, silly, passionate play was first properly introduced to me at age 11, and while I already had a love of Shakespeare, this did nothing to help with my already growing passion. Fairies? Magic? Star-crossed lovers? What more could you wish for? It's your standard romantic comedy plus magic. I also happened to be in between Harry Potter books, so there was that. Anyway, let's get down to business. Before we get into the summary, let's get a quick snapshot of the main events. Beginning. Dad doesn't let daughter marry who she loves. Then daughter and boyfriend and best friend and the guy she loves run away to a forest. Also, a bunch of actors start rehearsing and some fairies get into an argument. Middle. Fairies mess with humans and each other. Fights ensue. End. Everyone falls in love with the right person and lives happily ever after. So, beginning. Theseus, the Duke of Athens, is super excited because he's just about to get married to Hippolyta, the Queen of the Amazons, who is probably quite a bit less excited about this concept. He's like, listen, babe, I may have had to defeat you in battle to get you to marry me, but let's forget that now and be happy. Hashtag ancient Greek life. For all you DC fans out there, Hippolyta is Wonder Woman's mother, so imagine forcing that butt-kicking queen to marry some duke. Anyway, now on to the lovers. Because honestly, this is a rom-com. Hermia wants to marry her love, Lysander, but her dad, Aegean, says she has to marry Demetrius. Demetrius is in love with her, despite having made love to Hermia's best mate, Helena, who has been in love with him ever since. Shocker! Demetrius is a bit of a prick. Hmm, isn't it great that men have changed so much since then? So, there we have our love triangle, and Aegean is like, okay, I'ma take this to Theseus because he's the most powerful person around. He can force my daughter to do what I want. Theseus tells Hermia she has to marry Demetrius, or she will either be put to death, or she will have to abjure, give up, men forever, by entering a nunnery. Classic rom-com trope here, guys. Overprotective father. How original. Hermia isn't too keen on either, and nor is Lysander. So Lysander suggests they run away to move in with his rich single aunt who has no kids, and sees him like a son. (sighs) Don't we all wish we had one of these? Hermia then spills this to her bestie Helena, who tells her love Demetrius. So, those two then follow Hermia and Lysander into the woods. Hmm. I wonder where Sondheim got his ideas for a certain musical. Anyway, while this is happening, a bunch of workmen meet together to begin rehearsals for a play they will put on for Duke Theseus at his wedding. Quince, the leader and also writer and director has written a terrible play that he calls The Most Lamentable Comedy and Most Cruel Death of Pyramus and Thisbe. This is based on an actual story in Ovid's Metamorphosis, where Olshaki gets a lot of his inspiration. The plot is basically the same as Romeo and Juliet. Here we are introduced to Bottom the Weaver. He is a bit of the diva, and, well, his name rather says it all. Quince then introduces the rest by doing a roll call, and tells them each what part they will be playing. Bottom, of course, offers to play every role. Eventually, the play is cast, and they plan their next meeting in the woods. Next, we meet Puck, a shrewd and knavish sprite, who is in the service of Oberon, the king of the fairies. He meets one of Queen Titania's fairies along his way, and they talk about their masters who are fighting. 
Of course, just in time, the two come gliding in from opposite sides in a very dramatic entrance, and the arguing commences. Oberon is mad, because, among other things, Titania has been paying more attention to a young changeling boy, a child stolen from the fairies. Their arguments have scared all the fairies in the woods, or as Titania calls it, fairyland. Oberon wants the boy to be his henchman, i.e. run with his crew. But Titania won't budge. His mother was a votress, or follower of hers, and a friend, but she died giving birth to the child, and Titania promised to bring him up. Their falling out, it seems, has affected the weather. Think the Greek gods, their mood controls the weather. Hmm, maybe that's what's causing global warming. The fairies must be fighting again. They argue, and then Titania leaves in a huff. Oberon then hatches a plan to get his revenge. He decides to put love juice on her eyes, so she falls in love with someone else, distracting her long enough for him to steal the boy without her noticing and or caring. He sends Puck away to fetch the flower, and while he waits, in marches Demetrius with Helena in tow. He is being his usual prickish self, and Oberon decides he wants to intervene to make sure Demetrius falls in love with Helena before they leave the woods. Next, we see Titania getting ready for a nice nap. All her fairies sing her off to sleep as one stands sentinel, guard, nearby. Then Oberon sneaks over to her bower, her sleeping area, and puts the love juice on her eyes. This, of course, is the jealous boyfriend part of the rom-com trope, but with a little bit more creepiness added to it. After this, we return to our other pair of lovers, Lysander and Hermia, who are a little lost at this point. What is it with men and asking for directions? Although, to be fair, who's he... Although, to be fair, who's he gonna ask? A fairy? A shrub? A tree? So, they decide to sleep there for the night and wait for daylight so he can see where he's going. Because that's definitely going to help in a dense forest. But he's a man. He must know what he's talking about. Then he tries to smooth his way into some naughty time with Hermia, to which Hermia, like the clever woman she is, even more smoothly turns him down and makes him sleep a few feet away. So along comes Puck, who has been told by Oberon to use the same juice he used on Titania on the Athenian in the forest, so he falls in love with Helena. Little do either of them know there are two Athenian men in the forest, and... Those Athenians all look the same, so Puck, mistakenly, or not, you can decide that, doses Lysander, Hermia's boyfriend. And just in time, Demetrius and Helena come crashing through their makeshift camp. Helena sees Lysander asleep on the ground and wakes him up, worried something is wrong, and, of course, she is the first thing Lysander sees when he wakes up, so he falls instantly in love with her, much to her confusion, shock and dismay. She thinks Lysander is just playing some big prank on her and is like, Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? Why the puck are you teasing me? Hashtag more ancient Greek life. Lysander continues to be all gooey and shower her with praises and she runs off with Lysander hot on her heels. Hamia then wakes up from a nightmare and is all stressed out. She calls out to Lysander only to find... He's gone. Next, we return to the group fondly known as the Mechanicals. The craftsmen are rehearsing for their play. Bottom is being his usual diva self, as Quince airs a bunch of problems with the play. Bottom finds solutions, usually involving him, to each one as they come. The rehearsal begins and no one seems to get anything right. Along comes Puck, who loves a good prank. He is the OG Peeps, but with a bit more of a conscience being alive and all that, and sees Bottom step away from the playing area while he waits for his entrance, and decides it would be a great idea to give him a donkey, or ass head as they call it in the play. Bottom re-enters the scene and scares the pants off all his mates who flee in fear of this strange sight. Next, who should wake up but the fairy queen herself, who is under the influence of the love juice, and at the fur and the first thing she sees is Bottom with his ass head, and she is, of course, immediately madly in love with him. He has fallen victim to the jealous lover rom-com trope. Poor guy doesn't know what he's in for. 
The very confused but flattered bottom accepts her showering of love and allows her fairies to wait on him hand and foot and eventually allows Titania to lead him back to her bower. Next, Puck returns to his master, Oberon, who is wondering who or what it was that Titania fell in love with. Puck, of course, has the answer and tells his tale of transforming Bottom and the terror of the rest of the Mechanicals as they fled from him in fear. Puck is feeling pretty pleased with himself as Oberon tells him, this falls out better than I could devise. And then Oberon goes to ask him if he got the Athenian man as well, just as Demetrius and Hermia, Lysander's girlfriend, enter. Demetrius is moaning about the fact that she doesn't love him, and Hermia is trying to figure out what on earth he has done with Lysander, not realising he has gone off in chase of Helena. Oberon sees that he is still in love with Hermia and not Helena and rounds on Puck, who says it's not his fault because, according to fate, for every one man that's true to his girl, there are a million others that aren't. Wow. Hermia then runs off in a huff after realising Demetrius knows nothing about Lysander, and Demetrius falls asleep where he is, exhausted from his adventures. Oberon tells Puck to quickly scour the woods for Helena and bring her back so he can fix everything. Puck then charms Demetrius to make sure he falls in love with Helena when she returns. He then returns a few moments later with Helena and Lysander following close behind. This wakes Demetrius up, who is, of course, immediately in love with her. Helena, used to everyone disliking her, thinks this is all one big mean prank and is infuriated. The men argue over Helena and onto the scene comes Hermia, who is thrilled to have finally found her love, only to find he is in love with Helena. Helena blames Hermia for pulling a prank and Hermia blames Helena for stealing her man. What a mess. No one has really fixed anything, just made it messier. And the love triangle has been turned on its head. Oberon blames Puck again for this disaster, and Puck, rightfully this time, says it's not his fault. He didn't know there were two Athenian men in the woods. But also, he's glad as this there jangling, arguing, I esteem a sport. Sport back then meant any form of entertainment. Huh. If sport meant the same thing today, I would be way more into sport. <laughs> Oberon then tells Puck to draw all the lovers into the same place without knowing it, so he can fix his mistake. Puck does what he's told, but has a great time doing it. He mimics each of the men's voices and leads the lovers so astray that they collapse in a heap near each other. Hermia next to Lysander and Helena with Demetrius, and finally charms all the correct people. Next, we return to our favourite queen of the fairies and her new lover, the ass-headed bottom. Oh, Shakespeare, you punny, punny man. He is properly milking his position. I mean, who wouldn't? He has fairies waiting on him hand and foot, two to scratch his ears, one to get him food, another honey, and a literal goddess is in love with him. Titania is now ready for another nap. Or perhaps last time we left them, they didn't actually sleep. She winds him in her arms, and the last thing she says to him before she sleeps is, Oh, how I love thee. How I dote on thee. Right on cue, in comes Oberon to reverse the spell. After all, he got what he wanted, and then some. She was distracted enough to give him her changeling boy, and he got a good laugh while she was doting on bottom with an ass head. Though... I reckon he was probably a bit jealous. When he went to obtain the boy, he did upbraid, scold her, and fall out with her. He said he thought the dew on the flower crown she made him looked like they were crying in disgrace. Ooh, harsh. Titania then wakes up, fully undosed, and sees the ridiculous bottom, ass head and all, lying next to her. After she has fully registered the situation... Oberon commands Puck to remove his donkey head, so now he's just a normal bottom. Then Oberon immediately commands Titania to play music to make the four lovers who are asleep to sleep even more soundly, and then they walk off together again to prepare to bless Hippolyta and Theseus' wedding day. Speak of the devils, on to the scene come Hippolyta, Theseus and Aegeus off for a morning hunt. And Hippolyta is still taking none of Theseus' crap, 
no matter how hard he tries to big himself up. They run into the four lovers, asleep on the ground, and quickly realise who they are. Theseus wakes them up and demands an explanation as to what on earth they are doing asleep in each other's arms on the edge of the forest, half naked. Demetrius and Lysander mansplain the whole debacle of running away, and Theseus decides to go back on his decision to make Hermia marry Demetrius. Pretty pointless now, seeing as Demetrius is in love with Helena, and decides they will all get married at the same time and place as he and Hippolyta. As they depart, Bottom wakes up and tries to grasp what has just happened to him, thinking it all must have been a dream. You could perhaps call it a Midsummer Night's Dream. You got a feel for the guy. I mean, he went from being the centre of Titania's affections to being the bottom of everyone's jokes. But he doesn't let that slow him down. He decides the best course of action is to have Quince write a ballad of it to be performed at the end of their play. Next, we return to the forlorn players, mourning the loss of Bottom, as without him they cannot perform for the Duke, and therefore become se- and therefore become successful actors, as they were sure to be if they performed their play. When they are at their wit's end, on walks Bottom. All is merriment again, and they go off to prepare for their performance. Wrapping up time, the final act and scene. All the couples return just after being wed and Theseus calls for something to entertain them all till they can go to their marriage bed. On walks Philostrate, who is to Theseus as Puck is to Oberon. After a few quite absurd options, he reads about Pyramus and Thisbe, to which he responds, Merry and tragical, tedious and brief, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discourse? basically saying the descriptions are so opposing he wants to know how on earth they can make sense of it. On come the players and, shockingly, or rather, on come the players and, unsurprisingly, the play is quite a mess. Quince rushes through his opening speech and Bottom and his scene partner Flute keep messing up the word Ninus, calling it ninnies, as they did in rehearsal, and the impatient lovers continually comment on the disaster that is Pyramus and Thisbe, as they make all the typical bad actor mistakes. Remember guys, Shakespeare wasn't just a playwright, he was an actor, he was all too familiar with this. All this heckling was quite common at the time. Today, however, if you try and yell out commentary to the actors during the play, they will get really pissed off and you are likely to get banned from the theatre. You have been warned. Their play ends with a dance called a Bergamask, a dance from northern Italy, and then Theseus calls for everyone to go to bed. Park brings on the fairies who come on to close the show with a final dance to bless the beds of the lovers to bring it good fortune. He says one of my favourite lines from the play, I am come with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. He is there to tie everything up in a neat bow. Here's a pro tip for you guys. Every Shakespeare comedy ends with a wedding, so if you ever go to a play or read one and you aren't sure if it's a comedy or a tragedy, sometimes Shakespeare can be a bit confusing in that, if it has a wedding at the end, you can usually bet your bottom it's a comedy. Park comes in to convince the audience that everything they just watched was a dream, so don't be mad and don't think that this is promoting witchcraft. Think of this as like one of those disclaimers at the beginning of a film or TV program that says, the events in this play are fiction, any relation to real people is by accident, please King James don't come after any of us for promoting witchcraft. Well, that's Midsummer Night's Dream for you, and on to the insult section. Alright everyone, welcome to the insult section of the podcast. All of our insults from this play are from Act 3, Scene 2. Our first one is, Away you Ethiop. Here we have a really racist insult. Ethiop means dark person. I think it's important to bring it up to bring awareness of the history of racism in Elizabethan times, but also to bring up Shakespeare's dark lady who comes up quite often in Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, whose name was Emilia Bassano. Next is Lysander's line, same act and scene. Hang off, thou cat, thou burr. 
You minimus of hindering not grass made, you bead, you acorn. Most of these are quite self-explanatory. Lysander, in his charmed love for Helena, just throws out a slew of insults at Hermia, calling her clingy, cats and burrs, and just a number of ways to call her small and short, which I personally find deeply offensive as a short person myself. Hermia, oh me, you juggler, you canker blossom. This is Hermia calling Helena a deceitful double crosser and a canker blossom is a weed that destroys love. Pretty low for your best mate, but Hermia is short, so... Helena, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Another short joke. Seriously, guys, this section is just 90% short jokes directed at Hermia. Hermia, thou painted maple. Well, if Helena is going to call Hermia short, she will call her tall. But more than that, a tall painted piece of wood with no brains. Puck and Philostrate often like to insult the players because they are of lower status, but beyond Puck's line, hemp and homespuns, meaning men with cheap clothes, there isn't a specific insult that is actually really fun to bring up. So thank you everyone for tuning in to this week's In Plain Terms. Next time we will be doing Henry IV Part 1. Credits for this episode go to shakespeareswords.com, which has been an invaluable source to me. Thank you, Ben and David Crystal. Also, to Amber LB, author of Cauldron's Bubble, and Robert Miles, creator of the Shakespeare deck, for answering all of my questions and being incredibly supportive. Good friends are worth their weight in gold.